Good evening, Eagle's Nest. Welcome to Digging Deeper Moment number 19. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the fifth and final escalator that Jesus talks about in his Sermon on the Mount. He tells us to get off these escalators before it's too late. Now, there are five that we've looked at, and in our lives, these five things tend to grow and, until they'll actually take over our lives. And so Jesus is telling us to, to deal with them as soon as possible. So far, we've looked at anger, lust, lying, and vengeance. Tonight, we're going to look at hatred. Hatred is like cancer of the soul. And there's a lot of that going around right now these days. And so this is a very relevant message for us. Let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those that hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do this? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is quoting from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, when he sa which says, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The rabbi quoted this verse as they taught the people, and that's what Jesus is referring to. He's referring to what they've heard said. That means he's referring to what was taught by the rabbi about what the Scripture says. But over time, the rabbi had added to this verse, hate your enemy. This is not what this verse says at all. It says to love your neighbor. And at the time of the writing of this text, back in the Bible days, back in the time of Moses, that neighbor would have been a fellow Israelite. It says nothing about hating their enemies. They added this to this text. It's not a good thing for any of us to add stuff to God's Word. Jesus, who is the Son of God, and at, the t at this time was a rabbi with Seneca as well. A rabbi with Seneca was a rabbi who had the authority to interpret the Old Testament. And that's what he does for us. He lets us know what this scripture was really intended to say. It says, love your enemies. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. That's why he says, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for those who use you and persecute you. What better way to illustrate this? He's telling us that this text was not intended to give us a loophole for not loving people. It's a commandment to love our neighbor as ourself, no matter who that neighbor is. And why does Jesus say we need to love our neighbor as ourself? Because that's the way the Father loves us. God, His Father, our Father, loves everyone. He doesn't love what everybody does, but He loves people and He wants us to love them as well. You may remember from an earlier lesson that we talked about how the Hebrew language doesn't have a lot of adjectives. And so they would often use the term son of like an adjective in a descriptive way. So when Jesus says that so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, He's actually saying so that you may be like God. He's saying to love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying love your enemies because that's what God is like. He loves even his enemies. And this is confirmed in verse 48 when he says, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. So ladies, the next time your husband makes a mistake, the next time he does something you, you don't like, you need to quote back to him and say, God demands that you be perfect. But that's actually not what he means here. The word perfect means to be complete or to meet the highest standard. And what have we been learning as we've studied the Sermon on the Mount in this section? That Jesus in Matthew 5, chapter 5, verses 21 through 48, is contrasting his righteousness with that of the scribes and Pharisees. When we read in Matthew 5, 20, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, we will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is telling us here that we need to love our enemies. That's the standard if we want to be like God and enter his kingdom. He's not giving us a loophole. He's not giving us a way out. He's saying we need to be like God the Father. That's the point of the Sermon on the Mount. He's not saying, however, that we need to be perfect, perfect. He's just telling us that we need to live up to His standard. Instead of the minimum standard, we need to live up to God's standard. And, of course, verses 45 through 47 explain how to do that. First, in verse 45, He says, He says that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the just. 
He makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So what this is saying is that God blesses those that don't deserve it. God's love and His blessing gets poured out to people that really don't earn it. And none of us really earn it, but He's talking here about extremes, good people and bad people. God loves even bad people. He doesn't love what they do, but He's telling us to be like Him, to love those that don't love us back. And again, in verse 46, He's telling us, He says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? In other words, if you just love people that love us back, if we just love those that love us, love us, we're not meeting a very high standard. And the point of His righteousness and the point of being perfect or complete is to live up to His standard, which God loves people that don't love Him back. And again, in verse 30, 47, the third example He gives here is, and if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? In other words, if you just say hello and are nice to people that are nice to you, He's saying, you're really not doing a whole lot. And he says, tax collectors do that. Now, in Jesus' time, a tax collector was considered the worst of sinners. So what Jesus is saying to us is, if we just love people that we love, we're not many better than the worst of sinners. So we need to love like God loves. God tells us to love like He loves, and God loves IRS agents. That's what He's saying. People in the IRS, He loves them. None of us really love IRS agents, <laughs> right? He's saying to enter His kingdom, to be like God, we just need to love everybody. Now, that doesn't mean you get along with everybody. It doesn't mean a lot of things. But our heart inclination towards people should be love. And there, He's not giving us a loophole for excuses not to love certain people. And let's be honest. Some people are easier to love than others. And God's saying, if you want to be like me, you got to love people. It doesn't matter if they're easy to love or not. And so we've been talking about God's kingdom thus far in the Sermon on the Mount. And we've seen that God's kingdom is about the heart. It's an inside thing. We've seen in this chapter that God's kingdom is about expecting more than doing the minimum. And we've also seen that God's kingdom involves not looking for loopholes, but for looking for ways to live out what God commands us. And so this means that in order for us to be like God, to live in His kingdom, we're going to have to get His help. The truth of the matter is nobody can love like this without God's help. Nobody can live off of these escalators. No one can get free from these things without God's help. And these things that Jesus has gone over have a tendency to escalate and increase in our lives. And so all of us are going to need His power and His presence in order to fulfill His will and live like this. And so I want to encourage you, don't try to live out these commands on your own. Jesus is pointing us really towards Himself and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what He's referring to when He talks about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it's an eternal kingdom. It's an internal kingdom. It comes inside of our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's eternal. It lasts forever. It's a permanent kingdom. And it also is a kingdom that will empower us from the inside out. In God's kingdom, God's will is always done. In God's kingdom, we don't please ourselves. We please God. And that's why 1 John 3.22 says, Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments. What has Jesus been talking about here? About keeping His commandments, not looking for loopholes, and do those things that are pleasing to Him. The goal of a follower of Christ is to please God. That's what Jesus is teaching us here, and He's teaching us how to get off those escalators that lead us to not pleasing God. And folks, we're going to need His help. The kingdom of God is God's presence. It's God's power giving us the ability to live His purpose or His will. And so we end tonight on the last escalator with Jesus telling us to get off the escalator of hatred. Hatred has a tendency to increase like all the other ones. Get off it as soon as you can. If you need help, get some help so that we can be perfect, which means that we can live up to God's standard, which is to be like God. Not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But we can be like God and we can grow in the love and the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to begin the second part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which we're calling His Halakha, which talks about how to live out or to, to walk out the Old Testament commandments. We'll see you next week. Be safe.